Before we start, a small disclaimer. Mark is participating in this podcast episode in a personal capacity and not as a representative of Salesforce. His views are his own and does not imply an endorsement for any product or service on behalf of Salesforce. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I am joined today by Mark Engel. He's an account exec at Salesforce. And we've been working with Mark a little while. And I said to him, you should come on the podcast because despite, well, whilst being at Salesforce, he has lots of other interesting things going on. So, Mark, thank you for coming on. You're welcome. Nice to be here. Thank you. And um, in usual Dean fashion, there is absolutely no script. So he has no idea what I'm going to say, no idea what I'm going to ask him. And I've said to him, if we make a mistake, we're just going to keep going. So <laughs> You're very brave, Mark. <laughs> brave or, or slightly stupid, <laughs> maybe a bit of both. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about what you do at Salesforce and how you got into kind of sales. Okay. So um, I'm an account exec at Salesforce um, and uh, I've been there about 18 months um, and I look after the London region for the NHS. So it's only NHS that I deal with. It's about 145 trusts, about half a million people, and about 31 billion uh, going on in that marketplace. So it's, so it's quite a buoyant marketplace. I've been in the NHS business for about 12 years, something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, when Salesforce and I had a chat, it seemed like a great idea. I, I love what Salesforce are doing. And, and it can really change the face of, of the way that healthcare is delivered in uh, the whole of the NHS, actually. So, uh, so I really believe in it. Um, so uh, by, I got into selling, like a lot of a lot of people do, by accident, completely by accident. I went, I went along for a marketing role and they said, here's a phone, here's a book. Here's, here's the yellow pages you're renting macintosh computers back in the 90s and and i didn't know what to say i was too polite to say no thanks and i just here i am sort of you know 26 years later um but i think the thing that kept me in it was i didn't find it as hard as the next person i wasn't mm -hmm. good at it but i just didn't find it as hard i mean they were literally eating their hearts out every day they couldn't do it and i just found it really quite honestly quite simple you know mm -hmm. very very straightforward so and that's the way i've sort of you know kind of pegged myself in in my career is sort of you know just being not being fantastic but just finding it easier and finding easier ways to do things and almost smarter not harder really so, so uh, what's your take on how sales has changed or since you know whether we say since the internet but at least in the last few years what's changed in sales that you've seen so it's, it's dramatically changed. So one of the reasons for writing the book was um, that sales training is is far lower on the agenda of a lot of companies now. It's very much well, we've bought all these tools, go and use them. Um, so so sales training isn't what it was. I think that's the, that's the first thing. I think the second thing is it's very much more down to the individual. Mm -hmm. So it's down to the individual salesperson to kind of because there's so many more self-service tools out there like LinkedIn Navigator and, you know, all that sort of good stuff. They're expect the organization, especially big organizations are, are, are expecting you to be your own sort of franchise. And a mm -hmm. lot more of the work is down to you rather than the big corporates uh, rather than the big corporate organizations. So they're, they're, the inbound leads are leads that you create. Um, the pre-sales narrative is one that you create along with your pre-sales guy. So it's very much more down to you. I would say that's how mm -hmm. it's changed. And we're going to come to your book and your motivation to write the book, because I know you're passionate about improving sales and, and that's like a big thing. But um, just to talk about LinkedIn, because you mentioned it there a little bit, um, how do you see LinkedIn fitting into the sales process? What do you and and where do you see that that's going to go in terms of the mix of cold calling, email? How do you see LinkedIn? Because it seems to have, from my perspective, I know I'm biased. It seems like it's taking a bigger slice of the pie in terms of outreach than it's ever done. Very much so. I mean, you've got you've got the traditional methods of outreach, which is you know post, which is becoming less and less these days. Uh, although you funny enough these days if you send a letter you probably stand out to be fair because mm -hmm. how many letters do you receive but but email and um, all the kind of you know standard electronic um interactions that we have with with customers or try to have with customers they're becoming a bit difficult one of the reasons is gdpr and the opt-out mm -hmm. option so if you've got a database let's say it's salesforce and you've opted out of receiving you know any commercial emails from that organization that lead is dead to you. You can't use it. You can't send any commercial emails. So that's a diminishing part because if you keep sending 
emails to these people and eventually they're going to get they're going to get upset with you and they're going to go no so unsubscribe thank you very much and the law says when you unsubscribe you can't send any more of that or you shouldn't send any more of those emails there's penalties for doing that so mm -hmm. ha, you know you could be talking you could have a i don't know a bunch of councils and 20 percent of them you're not allowed to contact mm -hmm. so how, how do you contact them when well, you try and email them you try and phone them and then you're back to you know you're back to the same problem so it's kind of it's kind of circular problem it's a diminishing pie so i see linkedin as the the only one of one of the very few ways of, of outreaching to those potential customers where they are putting themselves out there on a platform they want to be contacted there's information out there and then you can start to in a um a softer way perhaps kind of have some i say in the book to have some stepping stones towards that trust mm -hmm. up to the point where you might have a phone call or a meeting so mm -hmm. it's really important and well I do want to ask you about the book, um, but something you said there about um, LinkedIn and and building that trust. You're not selling, you know, a widget. You're not selling a, a 50 quid thing. How have you found, how do you approach this from effectively? I know it's NHS and, you know, public sector, but it is the equivalence of an enterprise sale yeah. in that sense. How have you approached that? from LinkedIn because some people would say the decision makers aren't there. Oh no, they're 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 all there. They that so if you haven't so so it's almost like a like I say, it's that it's the underpinning to that trust to actually trust you enough to then have a phone call or have a meeting with you. So number one, quite a lot of the people are already on LinkedIn anyway. Whether they use the platform regularly or not, they're they're there. So you can you have a mm -hmm. connection point with them. The other thing is they will check you out for that even think about talking to you so if you haven't got a good profile if you've got a profile a picture if you've not updated if you haven't posted in the last 10 years or something like that what have they got to go on that doesn't help them build that trust so if you've got a good profile it says exactly what you do you're com you're in conversation with people about what you do and you're interested in what you do and you do that in the right way and thanks to maverick i now doing that in the right way um it's it, it's far more you know that they it's more substantive when, when you when you get that when you make that call and you say can, when you make that call on the email and you say can i can we have a phone call can we have a meeting they're much more likely to say yes so the decision makers are definitely there 100 percent, they're definitely there so anybody who says they're not they they are right cool and um, thanks for the promo there <laughs> no um, um but you also gave us an honorable mention in your book and just walk me through tell me a bit about the book so people can can kind of understand what it what what it is and also what what compelled you to write it so um what compelled me to write it well I, I, yeah that was that's a good question well i was in the middle of covid so i was massively bored um, that mm -hmm. was the first thing so i didn't know what to do with myself in the evenings and the weekends so i was yeah kicking around the house you know trying not to upset my wife and my son um which worked thankfully um and um again that training thing it just it just kind of kept kept eating away at me you know i've had the i've had the benefit of ibm training unisys training you know residential training schools and that sort of thing it it really it set me up in my formative years as a, as a salesperson and and today you've got younger salespeople talking to me saying how do you do this how do you do that how do you segment the market what do you mean segment the market what do you mean have a you know have a, have a territory planning meeting with a, with a partner what do you mean what, what what do you do in those meetings and i'm thinking this is this just is not fair so I, I basically wrote the book to my sort of 25 24 year old self when i was in my first five years of selling um and i wish i'd had this book myself because i would have saved myself a load of pitfalls but the people that the book's aimed at i think it's aimed fairly and squarely at the new sellers in mm -hmm. enterprise sales or corporate sales you know any anybody that's not selling to the general public so b2b really um, and they're in their first role they managed to get their first role and you know people come into these roles from selling cars from selling ice cream selling anything right in their first mm -hmm. role it's a real you know do or die kind of thing are you going to make it or not and it's really the basics of how you kind of construct that how you conduct yourself in a large organization how you work with other uh, other parts of the organization to get your i call it your unfair share of the of the pie of the help really the second person it's aimed at is the the entrepreneur so somebody mm -hmm. like you that's built something and you then need to go and you know it might be a widget it might be a piece of software it might be an app and you need to go and sell it to a corporate well you're a builder you're not a seller so 
two things there. One, you might have to go and do it yourself or you might have to hire somebody to go and do it. And what's a real expectation of them, of you and you of them over a period of time? So you get to know the basics without having to be a salesperson, really. And the third person it's aimed at is um, is sort of a management graduate or, you know, and they come out of business school and they're, you know, fully suited and they go and work for a large consulting firm. And they say, great, who am I going to consult with now? And they say, oh, no, you've got to sell it first. And then the colour drains and the dramatic music starts and they think I've been to business school to become you know, a second hand car dealer. <laughs> oh, no. Do I start? So in a weekend, you can probably, you know, with, with the book, you can probably get, you know, you can be dangerous over a weekend. You can you can get the basics, you can get the language and you sort of know what to do. And, and you're right there. Most people just learn on the job and copy what seems to be working for other people. Mm. Yeah, there's um, nothing wrong with that. I think you should model success. Absolutely. But that takes a long time. Mm -hmm. distilling it and that's long and that might not be your skill distilling that really complicated thing that person's doing and make it something you can do and you understand the abcs of it so that's what the book does it tries to break that kind of complex issue down into one two three four five and just follow that and then you'll kind of the flywheel will pick up speed so so in that kind of early stage of selling there's there's an element of an emotional roller coaster because you're doing things that let's be honest when you first get going fail more than they succeed yeah at least at the yeah. beginning how yeah, do you yeah. when at what point do you toughen up to that i think the point where you get some sort of success and you realize that this isn't a glass wall and that you can get a little bit of purchase on it if you do the right things and you do enough of it and i talk about failure in the book actually towards the end and you know i i welcome failure now because i've had the success and i continue to have the success but, you know, sometimes you have long periods of time where you're in the desert and you're just not closing anything, can't close a barn door, you know, and it's down to are you working for the right organisations and are you doing the right things? And, and also dealing with leadership and making sure they know you're doing the right things and you say what you do and you do what you say and you're very transparent about what you're doing. That makes leadership very comfortable with you. But you're right. I mean, it's just tough and, and many people have different ways of dealing with it. I mean, I'm sure we all know salespeople. Some people do the right things and they help promote themselves and they look at different ways of doing things. I look at different ways of doing things, which is how I came across Maverick in the first place. But I think, you know, it's just a resilience thing. There's, there's quite a few good books out there on resilience. And I welcome failure because we learn nothing from our successes. We learn everything from our failures. So I kind of, you know, I, I, in a sort of way, in a weird sort of way, I, I kind of welcome success so I can dissect it. And where did we go wrong? Even when we do a great deal. I look at it and um, there's a great book by Ben Hunt Davis called Will It Make the Boat Go Faster? And, and he talks about that in his book where he talks about winning a gold medal at the uh, Sydney Olympics. Even then, after winning, you're the best in the world at that point. They dissected it and said, how could we have done better? I mean, goodness me, you won a gold medal, you know, mm -hmm. but you, still, you take performance away from the results. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's that's kind of what I would say to that. Really? So I want to kind of I want to kind of ask you the same question in a different way um so we talked about how sales has changed how do you think the skill set of a salesperson has changed in terms of what you need and i'll give you i'll give you a reason why i'm asking this um i think we've gone through a shift in the way uh, uh, let me say my piece and then you can give your take on what i say and you know this is unscripted so disagree with me if you want <laughs> i see we've gone from if we think 70s 80s 90s there was an element of there was some sales people it was all relationship and who you know and just hit the phones and, and kind of just aggressive repetitive behavior to get the numbers yeah. but I, I i think a lot of it was about how good you were as a people person back then yep. mm -hmm. but now i think we've gone through a phase of that and i think we're going into another phase where it's like how good are you as a digital people person which is really different because if you've been used to doing the phone you've got some tonality to judge where they're at yeah you, you've got you know body language if you're in person but if you want to get leads from, you know, prospects from your desk, you have to be good at reading digital vibes. And I'm not so sure that that's a skill that's easily um, picked up for somebody who's been doing that. It's quite a tough transition, I think.
I could be yeah. wrong. What do you think? I mean, I, I, I do agree with some of that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and you're right. You are right. There, there's a, a different skill, but you need to add to the existing skill of being that people person because yeah. the goal of all this is to get to a face to face meeting. So you yeah. still need that, you know, I need to know how to behave with people in person. Um, so it's a it's a much more uh, diverse skill set now that you need to mm -hmm. have. It's not only that you need to have this digital piece in the front of that because you're right. Yeah. You don't get that interaction. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think that, you know, writing copy. You know, even if it's like one line, six words, something like that, writing that copy, you could, you know, I could spend an hour thinking about how on earth I'm going to, in a very short, very short line that this person will then read, because they're not going to read a diatribe, they're not going to read like a tome, they'll read a couple of lines and they'll decide, yeah, I want to talk to this person or I don't. So those, those copywriting, you know, that's, that's the skill really there. Mm -hmm. And also, as you say, trying to read into what they are, what they're sending back to you, if they do send something back is, and when is, how long is too long to leave it before you go back to them if they don't reply? It's all, you know, and, and I don't think we've got that skill in abundance. And you're right, the the older people like me, that's a new skill for them to learn, definitely. The, the, uh, the younger guys, they're going to have that piece, but they're not going to have that other piece at the end, which is the face-to-face the -face skills. So mm. it's uh, there is sort of, um, yeah, multifaceted. And I think it's got harder, really. Mm. I, I, was, I was saying to somebody, um, you know, it's almost like, you need a an, a, a, an, an element or a smidgen of marketing skills in there now. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. You, you need to be, you need to be aware of the basic principles of marketing. Your marketing department, if it's a large company should be helping you with that. And, and some responsibility does lie with them because they're interested in making leads happen and, you know, making inbounds happen and making your life easier. That's the kind of the job of mark, field marketing anyway. Um, but yeah, just yeah, as you say, it's a marketing skill as much as a sales skill now. So you also have another interesting thing that you do outside <laughs> yes. of Salesforce. <laughs> I do, yes. Um, um, it's a bit of a sort of sad story, really. My, my wife was ill. She got, she got cancer about 10 years ago. And uh, thankfully, she's OK now. But she said to me, you need to go and find a hobby. I said, well, I, you know, I cycle, I run. She went, no, something that really engages your brain for a long period of time. So a friend of a friend introduced me to a guy that made knives for a living. He made, <laughs> you know, bushcraft and hunting knives. I thought, that's really, that's interesting. OK. And uh, we went round and we hit it off. And he said, do you want to learn how to do this? And I said, well, yeah, OK, that'd be interesting. So every Tuesday night, I used to go up to his house. And he eventually started making knives for Ray Mears. Wow. So he's quite a quite a famous knife maker. Unfortunately, he uh, he passed away in 2016, and I sort of did nothing with the idea. And then I met up with a guy who's now my business partner in 2020, and we we started Salient Knives. So, salient knives. Yeah, Salient Knives, and it, it's um, hand handmade and even hand engraved uh, knives for the field sports market, for the for the hunting and shooting market. So we've got reseller in the States, we've got people in Norway buying them. And yeah, it's really interesting, actually, but it's a bit of an odd thing. But yeah, that, that's kind of encompassing all of my skills. And and um, and I'm using Maverick skills there as well, funnily enough. So it's a uh, it's very transferable, I would say. Yeah, I know. It's and the attention to detail. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a bit of saddo and I spend too much time on TikTok and YouTube watching people make things. Yeah. And I'm actually fascinated by almost like there's these skills that we used to have that we no longer seem to have like widely, you know, you know, people who can make things like, you know, my grandparents would make things and it's like, we don't even do that anymore. But when you showed me some of the, you know some of the knives you've made with the detailing on them and everything, it might it's like you've got to spend hours. That's like a labor of love on each knife, really, isn't it? Yeah, I mean the engraving alone. The engraving is done by a hand engraver that used to work for Purdy shotguns, and uh, he takes two days just to engrave two sides of the knife, um, and the handles take four days to hand checker and get to that that kind of really smooth polished oil finish. Um, and the knife itself probably takes another day and a half to two days to make. So really, you're not paying for the raw materials. Mm. You're paying for that person's time, but also the skill it took to learn that skill, to be able to mm. do it in that shorter time, if you like. So, yeah, yeah um, that's one of the reasons that I like doing it, because with with, with my corporate job, I, I don't actually make anything, you know, anything mm. physical. So this this kind of spoke to me, and I agree. It's a, it's a dying art, and, um, yeah, I just I just love it. I think it's great. It's really um, therapeutic, actually, because it's it's dull sometimes. And you're just sanding away and your mind wanders. And it's I think it's a good thing.
Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I think one of the things about work today, um, you know, if we look back, I keep saying 40, like 20 years ago, but 20 years ago, it wasn't 20 years ago. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I people keep saying, I keep seeing these videos about, do you realize 20 years ago was 2000 and like two? And I'm like, really? I, I always in my head, I think 20 years ago was like 1980 or something. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, yeah. <laughs> um, but we 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 have a work uh life now that's very mental driven or in you know uh, thought driven versus labor driven, you know, where you, the, the sweat of your brow and all that kind of stuff. And I think it creates um, you know. 20 years ago um it was like okay you've you've hurt your back you can't work anymore we're now seeing more people where it's like actually i'm i'm burnt out mentally i can't think properly i'm i'm exhausted how do you how do you i, I know you do the knives but in a sales environment where you've got targets to hit and all that kind of stuff that can be quite a big pressure on somebody especially if it's you know tough economic circumstances have you ever helped anybody or talked about this in terms of how do you balance that pressure that you need a healthy level of pressure to perform but too much pressure can actually make somebody ill basically absolutely um and um you know partly my wife's illness you know i don't mind talking about this because you know i think it helps if people talk about it but part of my wife's illness and you know she recovered from that but there was a there was a chance she wouldn't and um and, and partly because of the pressure of the job and just the pressure of life these days life is just moving so fast you know certainly for people like ourselves that have lived through the 80s and, and things like that you know it's a it's much more much more information you have to take in even on a personal level and i, I you know i've struggled with mental health i, I struggle with anxiety um but i would say there's a few things you can do to look after yourself one is to talk about it okay friends and then go and seek professional help there's so many places now and so many companies are providing that and actually it absolutely helps it helps me to talk about it second thing is um have two phones right so my work phone is a work phone and it stays on my desk at night and it stays on my desk when I go on holiday. I actually pay for a personal phone, you know, that I take with me on holiday and my friends and family can get hold of me. That's great. And then I have a work phone that goes off, just like your PC goes off. Because if you're constantly, constantly, you need to sort of be able to disengage and be able to have a personal life and, and go and do things that you enjoy with your family and your friends and do sports and watch TV and do whatever you want to do. If you're constantly looking at that phone going i wonder what that's happening I wonder what's happening there you don't disengage um and, and i think that's a really important thing to do disengage and, and find out what you like and go do that as a almost like as a regiment mm -hmm. you know be good to yourself is all yeah. i would say and you're right it's all above the neck stuff it's not sweat of your brow and and i think we are um in the west we we are guilty of burning people out because we're treating above the network like physical work and it's just not like that it's it's very more very much more subtle i think mm -hmm. yeah and and it is you know there's something like if if you've done a you know a 12 hour or 10 hour or eight hour shift you know lifting stuff moving stuff expending energy there is something therapeutic about coming home at the end of the day but actually i find when i go home it takes me an hour or so to get my head clear of what's happened in the day yeah yeah and i don't know about you but when i go on holiday it takes me at least a day and a half to yeah. wind down i'm not fully wound down for a good day and a half yeah you know i'm still still thinking about work i'm still all oh, right well, i'll go do that when i get back you know and you just need to another thing that's really helped me which makes me sound a little bit woo woo less so these days is is, is meditation um you know it's it's dynamic rest for your brain and mm. it really really helps i mean it's it's mad how it does help because all you're doing is sitting in silence with your eyes closed for 20 minutes but you do that and i can't tell you the difference it makes it's really very very powerful very powerful so mark where can people check out your book so you can type my name if you type it incorrectly m-a-r-c-e-n-g-a-l-l -L. if you type it incorrectly into amazon you can get the book there you can get the audio book there as well it's on audible um and you can also get it on apple as well so if you've got apple and you prefer that as a platform it's there too
So Brilliant. you can buy paperback on Amazon and also Kindle. And as I say, the Audible's there too. Did you do the audio yourself? I didn't. Like most people, I can't stand the sound of my own voice. So <laughs> I've got some voice talent, uh, great voice talent. It's great because I can't explain it too much, but it sounds like he's telling you a secret. So mm. it's really engaging. I love it. It's really good. Yeah. No, I, I love the uh, the voices where it's like, welcome to Audible. Do you know what I mean? I can't do it. And it's like... <laughs> Um, yeah, I wish I could, but no, I hate the sound of my own voice. Yeah. <laughs> Mark, you've been a superstar. Thanks for coming on. Um, I'll pay you later for the uh, little mentions of Maverick. So thank you so much for that. Um, uh, guys, go check out Mark. We'll put his link to Amazon, uh, the book on there. We'll also put his LinkedIn details. Wherever you're watching or listening, we'll put that there as well. So you can connect with Mark. You can grill him on what's in the book. And you can say he held up really well, given it this was totally unscripted and he had no idea what I was going to say. So, Mark, thank you for agreeing to this. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, Dean. You're very welcome. Enjoyed I, it. I don't know whether it was good for your career or not, but... Um... We'll see. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Mark. No problem. Thanks, Dean.